a certain man from Caesarea. The the persecution which scattered the disciples from Judea throughout all Judea subsided shortly after the Apostle Paul's conversion. Now, this period of relaxed persecution in 38 A.D. came because the emperor made an order to erect a statue of himself throughout various quarters of his empire, and that it, of course, should be worshipped. Now, this also included having his statue in a temple at Jerusalem. Now, this enraged the Jews, and they gathered in great masses, young and old, male and female, to entreat the governor to intercede for them. That such a destruction, I mean, a desecration of their holy temple and holy city and land should not be permitted. But the only thing that the emperor did was to be able to accomplish was to issue a command to leave the temple untouched. But many of the emperor's statues were erected outside of the Jerusalem gates. And soon after, news came that all the synagogues in Alexandria had been turned into temples to Caesar. Now, these things lasted till January the 24th, A.D. 41, at which time the emperor was murdered. So, therefore, this provided a breeding period for the apostles to reorganize and to edify the brethren. We read in Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 32, and this is from the New International Version, where we find the Apostle Peter visiting the brethren in Lydia. This was a town which was east of Joppa. There he found a certain man called Aeneas. And he said, and this Aeneas had been bedridden for eight years through paralysis. Now Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And immediately Aeneas got up. Now all those who were living in Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Well, by the Lord's providence, this is how the early church had its beginning and how it was established. Now, while Peter was in Lydia, two disciples from Joppa came to him and asked him to quickly come to Joppa with them. And so Peter immediately went with them. Now, this request was made because, as we read in verse 36, that's Acts the 9th chapter and verse 36, that amongst the disciples of Jaffa, there was a woman called Tabitha, in which, uh, which in the Greek was called Dorcas. Now, her life was fully devoted to the good and the charitable actions, which shows she was constantly doing things to help the poor. But as it happened, just at the time when she was, uh, at this time, that she was taken ill and she died. On Peter's arrival, they took him upstairs and all the widows, they all came out and they stood by his side, weeping and showing him all the uh, underclothing and cloaks and garments and all kinds, all kinds of uh, of cloaks and garments that Dorcas made for them. Now, after Peter asked all of them to leave the room, he knelt down and he prayed. And then, turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. Well, she opened her eyes, and as soon as she saw Peter, she sat up. Well, then Peter took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. 
Now this was Peter's most notable miracle. And it became known throughout the whole of Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. Well, Peter took advantage of the good impression made on the people's minds by this miracle by preaching to them the great truths of Christianity and thus established them in faith. We read in verse 43 that Peter remained there for some time staying with a tanner called Simon. Now, Peter could have stayed with any of the other brethren in the city. Why did he stay with a tanner? I do not know for sure, but here is a suggestion from several Bible scholars. They say that Luke, the writer, mentions three times in the Apostle that he lodged with Simon a tanner, and that was in Acts 9.43, and then in Acts 10, verse 6, and then also verse 32. You see, a, a tanner was constantly dealing with dead animals. And this occupation was thus regarded with repulsion by the Jews because it necessitated more or less ceremonial uh, contamination, and especially when he worked with unclean animals. The fact that Peter was willing to dwell with a tanner reveals that he, like unlike many of the other Jews, was already altering his views with reference to Old Testament ceremonial laws. They had a lot of them. Tanning skins produced a foul smell, and hence tanneries were outside the city and by the sea because the tanners used the seawater in the process of converting hides into leather. Now, even in Joppa, the trade appears to have been re reputed unclean, and therefore this Simon had his house by the seaside. Nevertheless, the apostle Simon Peter, Simon Peter, <laughs> stayed with Simon the tanner, in Joppa for a considerable number of days until Peter received a request by a certain man in Caesarea. He wanted him to pay him a visit. Well, who was this certain man? What was so important that an angel appeared and spoke to him? We find some answers in the 10th chapter of Acts. And first of all, we read in the first verse, Acts 10, 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. He was a centurion of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man and one that feared or he reverenced God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now Cornelius lived in Caesarea, which was the seat of Roman government, in Pal in the Roman government in Palestine and also in Syria. And this is where the, the Roman governor had, uh, was headquartered and possibly Cornelius' regiment had a part of the governor's security. Now, in his day, 65% of the Roman soldiers were from Italy. Therefore, his regiment was called the Italian Regiment. Now, 60 years before Christ, Rome conquered Judea, Galilee, and Samaria and the Jews lost their freedom and independence. Therefore, from time to time, they tried to resist Roman authority. But as a result, Rome had to keep military troops in and around Israel to control uprisings and rebellions. 
The Jews didn't like Rome or their Roman troops, and the feeling was mutual. Rome was an excellent example of arrogance. They thought that they were the superior civilization and believed that they ruled the world because they were the wisest and the most powerful. All but the most educated Romans believed in many gods, and serving these deities was a major element of Roman life. Now, despite all of this, Cornelius was different. He was a Roman Gentile, and Gentiles were any kind and everybody except God's chosen people. The Jewish people were not allowed to associate with any of them. In Matthew 15, 22 to 28, in the new, uh, new translation, a Gentile woman who lived there came to Jesus pleading, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed of a demon and torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. And then his disciples even urged him to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is just bothering us with all of her begging. But then Jesus said to the woman, You know, I, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she came and worshipped him and pleaded again, Lord, Lord, help me. Well, Jesus responded, It isn't right, by saying it isn't right to take food from the children and, and throw it to the dogs. Oh, she replied, That's true, Lord. But you know, even dogs are allowed to eat the crumbs that fall beneath their master's table. Dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now, Cornelius knew what the Jews felt about him, as we read in Peter's statement in verse 28, that's verse uh, 28 of chapter 10, Acts 10, where he said unto them, Ye know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or even into, uh, or, or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now, this whole episode was arranged by the Heavenly Father. You see, it was God's time. His clock had struck. It was October the 1st, 36 A.D., the end of Israel's 70 years a special favor. In Exodus 19 and 6, we have the promise to natural Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Exodus 19 and 5 tells us, Now therefore if ye, if, the little word if, ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people from all of the earth, because all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Well, for more than 16 centuries, Israel waited for the fulfillment of God's promise, and in God's due time, their Messiah arrived. As John the Baptist proclaimed in Matthew, the third chapter, in verse 2. And remember, he said, Repent ye, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or among you. He is among you. Just down the street, remember? He is among you. And we read in John, the first chapter, in verse 19, where the Jews and the priests asked John the Baptist, Are you the Messiah? And John replied, No. But speaking of Jesus, he said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou seest the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Spirit. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. In verse 40, that's John, the first chapter in verse 40, we read one of the two uh, which heard, we read of one of the two which heard John speak and they followed him. His name was Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother. He first find it, his own brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. Yes, the Jews were God's chosen people and they had the opportunity to be the royal priesthood. But Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.8 that Israel as a nation stumbled in that they did not recognize their Messiah, Christ Jesus. And they didn't recognize when he was among them. He was among them performing miracles and preaching the gospel message. They rejected his sacrifice as the basis of justification. We also read in John 1 and 11 that he came unto his own, and his home received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So therefore, Jesus sadly said to the nation of Israel, in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and verse 37, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often... How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chick, chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Well, desolate here means that their exclusive special favor from God is now withdrawn. As we mentioned before, this special meeting of the Apostle Peter and Cornelius occurred because God's time clock, clock had struck. It was October the 1st, 36 A.D., the end of Israel's 70 years of special favor. Now, this event was so vitally important that God gave both of them instructions in a vision. Cornelius received his vision first, as we read in Acts the 10th chapter in verse 3. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and guess what? That was the hour of Jewish prayer, hour of Jewish prayer, when at about 3 in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, well, Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial off offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. Now he's staying with Simon the Tanner 
whose house is by the sea. Well, as the record bears out, Cornelius was evidently converted to God and righteousness years before this incident. He was a worshiper of God and a benevolent almsgiver and his love for righteousness and his consistent life were all recognized by all that knew him. Even though Cornelius was not a Jew, he prayed to God. Jesus said in John 4, verse 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such, he seeketh such to worship him. Well, the angel told Cornelius that God was aware of all of his good deeds and prayers. But the angel inferred that something more must be done before he could be accepted with God. So the angel instructed him to send for the apostle Peter. Well, when the angel of the Lord departed, Cornelius was overfilled with shock and joy. But he quickly obeyed by calling two of his devoted servants and a devoted soldier and told them all that had happened. And then he sent them to Joppa as the angel instructed him. Cornelius had great faith in God, and it was demonstrated as we read in verse 24, Acts 10, 24, where we read that Cornelius knew that Peter would come. He he knew that he was going to come for sure. So he called together all his relatives and, and his close friends, and they waited for Peter to come. Now, there were many questions that they asked Cornelius. I'm sure there was something like, what do you think the Apostle Peter would tell us? Well, it's interesting to note that even Peter did not know. Even Peter did not know. We will see that when we get to verse 29. Meanwhile, as we read in verse 20, verse 9, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter, the Apostle Peter, went up on his roof to pray. Now he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being uh, prepared, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened unto him and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners from heaven. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him to get up, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, surely not, Lord. No, 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 no. I've never, never done this thing. Peter replies, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Well, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. And then immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. Now, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of all of this, of his vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was, and they stopped at the gate. And they called out and asked if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Now, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, this is the apostle Peter, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. 
Well, Peter was confused. He was confused. What is God telling me? And when he went downstairs, there he saw two men and a soldier. <laughs> he looked as am I going to be arrested? Well, in verse 21 we read, the note, the high praise that the three men gave to Cornelius. They said, Peter went down and said, well, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Well, the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and a God-fearing man who is respected by all of the Jewish people. You know, a holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Well, then Peter invited the men into his house to be his guest for the night. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along with them. The following day, they arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives, as he mentioned before, and his close friends. And as Peter entered the house, Cornelius uh, met him and he fell at his feet in reverence. Imagine a centurion bowing down to a Jew. He fell down at his feet in reverence. But Peter said what? Peter made him get up immediately. He said, stand up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Well, while t- talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. Well, Peter said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. You see, now Peter was beginning to understand the meaning of his vision. He did not know what God wanted him to say or to do. So he asked them in verses, in Acts, the 10th chapter, verses 29 to 33. He says, may I ask you who sent for me? May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. And suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. And it was good for you that good that you could come. Now, we, notice he says we, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to tell us. I remember, note the, that Cornelius did not say we, he, he, I'm sorry, Cornelius says we, not just referring to himself, but he included all those relatives in his family in his room. Now, through the power of of the Holy Spirit, Peter knew what God wanted him to say. Now, Peter was going to use that second key that he was given before. Remember what we read and what we read in Matthew, the 16th chapter, in verse 19? It says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And this was said to Peter, remember? A key, you know, 
symbolizes the right or authority to open. And in Acts, the second chapter, verse 14, on the day of Pentecost, the Lord used the apostle Peter uh, to use that first key as his special mouthpiece in opening the door of the kingdom to a Jewish people. To the Jewish people. To all that were there in that that were there of the right heart condition to receive the blessings. You remember how Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and hearken to my words. Well, three and a half years later, When the time had come for the message of the gospel to go to the Gentiles, it was the Apostle Peter who was granted the privilege of throwing the door wide open by the sermon that he preached to Cornelius. Thus we read in Acts 10, chapter and verse 34, Then Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism by, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does right what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Christ's kingdom, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he uh, went around doing good and healing all that were uh, under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Now, we are witnesses of everything that he did in the country of the Jews and of Jerusalem. He says they killed him by hanging him on a cross, And I think when Peter said these last words about Jesus hanging on the cross, I think that uh, Peter has had a flashback to that. Peter had a flashback to that event. I think this because many Bible scholars say that the centurion at the cross was Cornelius. And as we mentioned before, the Roman soldiers responded to any uprising to keep things in check. Thus, Cornelius would have been there at this great uprising, the crucifixion of our Lord. I think that Cornelius heard about the many miracles that Jesus performed and personally heard many of the words of life that Jesus spoke, as we read in John 7, 46. The officers answered, never man spake like this man. Well, if Cornelius was that centurion at the cross, I am sure that he was perplexed. You know, Jesus was a Jew. And above his head on the cross was the inscription that this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Why did they kill their king? Why did God allow this to happen? Well, three and a half years later, Peter was giving him the answers to these questions. And he gave them all of the information that was needed for them to be accepted by God and to be begotten, be begotten of the Holy Spirit. In verse 43, we read that Peter was near the end of his sermon. And when he said, all the prophets testify about him, that is Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. I think that Peter is saying in his heart, I believe, Lord, I believe. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard that message in that room. You know, the the circumcised Jews, (laughs) the believers who were there, that came with Peter, they were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit 
had been poured out even upon the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. You know, it was Pentecost being repeated again. Brethren, we are here today as spirit-begotten sons of God because of this event. But we must be very careful to heed the warning in Romans 11th chapter, verses 19 to 21. The Apostle Paul, using the example of an olive tree, said, You will say then, branches were broken or pruned off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. But they were broken or pruned off because of their unbelief, their lack of real faith. And you are established through faith because you do believe. Therefore, in other words, so do not become proud or conceited, but rather stand in awe and be reverently afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches because of unbelief, neither neither will he spare you if you are guilty of the same offense. So may we be grateful and be faithful.